What's up? Today I'm making fish and chips. Oh yeah, you want a bite? Let's go do it. fish and chips for y'all. I have already salted my fish and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. But meanwhile, I want to talk about the actual chips. So chips and fries are not exactly the same thing. I'm going to show you the difference. So the first thing that I have here is a russet potato. What you would actually be using is called a Maris Piper potato. That's like the more traditional potato. It's a golden skinned and a white flesh potato. The Maris Piper potatoes are pretty exclusive to England and much more difficult to find here in the States but the russet is going to be like the next closest thing, right? So I'm going to cut this into nice little planks and planks are when you kind of make like flat little guys like this, right? Got that nice sharp knife so I can get right through there. In case you missed me sharpening my knife the other day. It was a little obnoxious, I'm not gonna lie. I heard you was up in the club last night all hugged up on some tramp. But you can do whatever size chips that you want to. I'm kind of doing like a steak fry size, if we can call it that. And I have a bowl of water next to me, and my water is really, really salty. And as salty as the salty sea is what one of the chefs would actually say to me. And that is a big key here because they're going to be letting go some of their starch, but they're also going to be absorbing a little bit of the water. And if the water has no flavor, your chips aren't going to have any flavor. And that's just the sad fact of the news. So these are going to go over here into my bowl of very salty water. And by the way, I changed this water out twice already. You want it to be nice and clear. We're trying to get rid of a lot of the starch because russets are really high in starch. And if we were using like a Yukon Gold or something like that, you wouldn't even necessarily have to soak them. But in this case, we're going to go ahead and soak them. I'm gonna let these set for about five minutes and we're gonna come right back to them. Also over here, I have my water. It is the same deal over here. This is heavily salted, and when I say heavily salted, I mean as salty as the salty sea. I put probably a quarter cup of salt, and it's iodized salt that I'm using, a table salt. There's probably a quarter cup of salt inside of this. I think this is a seven quart pot. So I have that coming to a boil over here. Right here is my fish, and I've had this in the refrigerator for about an hour, and what I did is I used some kosher salt, and I lightly salted all of the fillets, and I also cut them in half. So the purpose of salting the fish is that it's going to draw a lot of moisture out of the fillet, and it's gonna firm the flesh up a little bit, which is really gonna help it out when we're frying it. These all started off this size right here, and what I've been doing is I'm just cutting them in half. So this is gonna be your choice. You can choose to cut them in half, or you can keep them whole doesn't really make a difference except that if you cut them in half you get more batter obviously on the outside so you're gonna get more of the batter flavor whereas if you have the bigger fillets you're gonna get less of the batter flavor so these hung out in the fridge for about an hour but I'm going to go ahead and put them back in there until we're ready to use them because obviously we want to keep them nice and cold for food safety reasons and also to keep that flesh nice and firm if you get these, by the way, these were previously frozen, which is fine to use, but you want to make sure you draw all that moisture out. That is going to be one of the biggest keys in making these awesome. And the trick to that is salt them, cover them. I have a layer of paper towels. Can you see my layer of paper towels that I have going on right there? And I have a second layer under that. Those are drawing all that moisture as the salt is pulling it out. This is the key trick to getting these nice and solid and ready to fry. So my water has hit a boil over here and I'm ready to go ahead and start adding in my fries. Keep in mind that when we put these in, we only want them simmering because again, they're gonna fall apart. We wanna get them like almost to where we're gonna make mashed potatoes with them. It's gonna take about six minutes because they're cut fairly, that's not a good example, because they're cut fairly thin. I'm gonna cut this dude. I don't even know how he ended up in there. What the heck? Hang on. All right, it's not a big deal. 
So I'm going to just go ahead and start adding these into my water over here. And my water was just now at a super rapid boil, right? Which is where you want to start it because as you start to add these in, it's going to cool your water down. So you want to start with a super, super hot pot of water. And hopefully these are all going to fit in here without me overflowing it. I got a little bit overzealous with my potato chopping and that's okay because I love french fries, don't you? I'm going to bring these back up to a simmer and they're going to simmer for about six minutes. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and make our tartar sauce for now. What I have already started in my bowl here is some mayonnaise. I didn't measure it, but it's probably like a cup-ish of mayonnaise. And I have a whole bunch of goodies to add to it. So into my mayonnaise, I have some beautiful fresh dill. All right? Ah, fresh dill. I also have some parsley going in here. I don't like to put too much parsley because I don't want it to overwhelm the flavor. I want it in there for color. I want it in there for a little bit of flavor. It's kind of like the accent flavor. So for me, and you know, do it for you, but for me, I don't like parsley to be the main flavor. I like my dill to stand out a little bit more. I'm also going to add in some shallots, just like a little handful of these right here. The rest of my shallots are going to go into my mushy peas here in a few minutes because when you're serving fish and chips, you definitely have to serve the mushy peas with them. I have a little bit of these beautiful dill pickles that I chopped up. You could also use gherkins, you could use a sweet relish if you wanted to. This is kind of going to be according to your taste, but for today I'm going to go ahead and use these beautiful dill pickles. They're just in a small dice here. Into the bowl they go. And then I have these capers which are absolutely gorgeous capers and into the bowl they go. A little bit of salt, just a tiny little bit because the pickles already have salt, your capers already have salt, you don't need, I mean like a pinch of salt, and some freshly ground black pepper going in there. If you don't want the black pepper flakes, then use white pepper, that's fine too. But this is gorgeous, like we have this really chunky kind of like fun, yummy tartar sauce going on. Oh, you guys, I almost forgot my lemon. Got my lemon. Got my lemon. My lemon wants to go in. I do need my knife back because I'm going to do a little bit of zesting here, but I don't want any gigantic pieces of zest going in there. I don't want to get a big long piece of zest. And if you look at what my zester is doing, see these big giant pieces of zest coming off of there? I don't want to bite into one of those personally, so I'm going to use my knife, put this into a nice little bundle, which is how you chop a lot of things, right? Put it in a nice little bundle and just like kind of run it across it like so, scoop it up, throw it in, gorgeous. Give that a nice little stir, this is absolutely beautiful, do you even see it? I think we'll go ahead and give it a little squeeze of juice too, why not, we're doing it, right? Give this a nice little stir. Give it a taste. Yeah, I use my finger. Mm. I'm the one eating it, who cares? It's good. So, so very good. Best tartar sauce around, I'm telling you. This is gonna go into the fridge and it's gonna be just kinda like marinating and all the flavors are gonna melt together while we cook the other stuff. So these are coming out. These are so very delicate when they are coming out. You can see that they're kind of falling apart. They're gorgeous. These are just where we want them. Oh my goodness. We're going to put these into the refrigerator and that is actually going to help them firm up quite a bit. I'm going to put them into a single layer and they are going to go into the fridge. So I'm just going to flatten them out and put them in the fridge. Okay, so we are ready to fry our fish. Yay! So let's go ahead and make our flour dredge. Here I just have regular flour, AP flour, all purpose. And I'm going to add a little bit of garlic powder and paprika to it. I probably have about a teaspoon and a half of garlic powder and maybe a half of a teaspoon, a teaspoon of paprika. And you can definitely adjust that to your own taste. And you can add also, if you wanted to in there, a little bit of dried dill or something like that. But I'm kind of cool with these seasonings. You also always want to make sure that you put salt into this, right? 
and a decent amount. I'm also going to add in some black pepper and this is just going to be seasoning the flour that is going to go onto the fish. It's really important to season in every single layer of what you're doing. I'm going to give this a nice little stir, a nice little mix until it is really well combined. And this little bread pan is perfect for what I'm doing because of the shape of my fillets, right? So I'm going to just kind of leave this alone for a minute and move over here to my batter. What I have here is a combination of two different flours. I am using a self-rising flour and if you don't happen to know the difference between regular flour and self-rising, it's just that self-rising has a little bit of baking powder along with some salt added into it. So basically it has a chemical rising agent that's been added into it. The other starch that I'm using is a rice flour and just combining these starches is really gonna add to the crunch of our you know, batter of our beautiful stuff that we have going on. And we're gonna sift this. Sifting, sifting. I also have a little bit of cornstarch. It's about a tablespoon-ish if you wanna measure. And I'm gonna just keep on sifting that right down into my little bowl here. See, this is beautiful. So I also wanna make sure that I season my batter. Obviously, we're gonna use a little bit of kosher salt going in there. And I'm gonna do just like two little pinches I also have some freshly ground black pepper that I want to put in. I'm going to give this a little bit of a whisk before I add my liquid ingredients in. And this is looking gorgeous, by the way. The next thing that I have is my beer. I don't have a certain measured amount that you want to add in, but I do want to talk for just a second about the kind of beer that I'm using. For me, I don't want to waste my money on an expensive beer that I'm going to put into a deep fryer because you're losing all of those subtle nuances that you paid for. It's like taking a hundred dollar bottle of wine and freaking boiling it down. You're never going to taste like the lavender and the coffee and the whatever that you paid for. So why am I paying to boil it out of my food? I'm not. I'm going to use a cheap beer that comes in a can. Why am I using a canned beer? Because it has more carbonation in it generally. And what I'm looking for is a light, crispy batter. That is my goal here, light and crispy, and that's what I'm gonna get with a canned light beer. Canned dark beer, same difference, whatever you wanna use, but you guys, don't boil your money away. That's what I'm saying. You want this to be ice cold, by the way, and this is really cold. We had it in the freezer, and I'm just going to start kind of working it into my batter here. And I'm going to stop when I get just, ooh, it's frozen. God, I have beer slushy. That's okay. I'm going to go ahead and work what I can in. And then what I want to do is add in a shot of vodka. So why am I adding vodka? First of all, because... Chef likes vodka, Woo. and secondly because the high alcohol content that's in the vodka is going to evaporate really rapidly and that is going to add to the crispiness of our batter. And again, my goal here is super crispy batter. Do you see that I have beer slushy? That's okay because the colder your batter, by the way, the more effective the crispier that you're going to end up with. And a lot of people actually will take a bowl of like ice water and put it underneath their batter while they're doing it. And it's really not a bad idea. So I'm going with super cold beer right out of the freezer. I'm gonna give this a really nice little whisk here, put a little sweat effort into it. Come out, you turn into a slushy, <laughs> slushy beer. <laughs> so I just wanna go ahead and move my whiskins, my whiskerkins out of the way drop in the sink and I want to show you the texture of the batter so it took a 16 ounce beer right and what you're looking for it's called ribbons and I just ditched my whisk but if you look at this kind of get down in there you can see that when I swish my spoon across it it's leaving lines so watch that's what they call ribbons right so this is what we're looking for for a really nice texture in a batter this is what it's pouring like I want you to really get a grip on what the batter looks like so there it is, I'm gonna start my fish. First of all, I'm going to drop my basket down into my oil, okay? Here I have my piece of fish. I'm gonna take my paper towel, 
I'm just going to kind of give it a nice little pat right here. Get that excess moisture off of it. We don't want to ruin our batter with the excess moisture. Give it a little dredge. Dredge it in the flour ends, both ends. Give it a little pat. Pat its booty. Little booty pat. Little pat in the booty. Want all that excess off of it? Let it sink. Let it sink inside of there. Next piece, same thing. We're going to do this over and over, right? Give it a little pat. Pat its booty. The booty pat, then pop the booty. Drop it in there, let it sink. All right, so now these guys, give them a little help, give them a little batter coat, right? Let it sink and you cover it. It's part of it, you guys, that's part of the key. Let it sink and you cover it, that's part of the key. You gotta go fishing for them. You gotta go fishing for them. It's like a fun game. I'm gonna dirty this hand up right here. You got a clean hand, and you got a dirty hand. Right? Alright. So keep that in mind for a second. I'm going to reach my dirty hand in. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> oh my goodness, you got to stop. X is laughing at me. I'm going to let this drip off of there. Let it give a little drip. When it feels like it's coming to a point, that's when it's telling you that it's ready to go into the fryer. When it goes in the fryer, you're going to tease it a little like this first. Like, oh, you're going in the oil. You're about to go in, sucker. And then you're going to lightly lay it down. That's how you put them down. So you ready? We're going to do another one. We're going to pick it up. We're going to let it drain for just a second. Let it drain for a second. You're going to get kind of a point. You see how it's coming to a point right there? When you get that point, you're going to take it over to the oil. You're going to tease it a little. Oh, don't you want to go into the oil? And you're going to lay it down. That's how you do it. That is the way that you do it. Ready? No, let's not do one more because my fryer is not that big. So I'm going to take my clean hand. Got my dirty hand. Okay. So what you're going to do, you're going to take a little spoon of oil. You see how that's floating? You're going to kind of baste it. Baste it. Do a little basting here, guys. Basting the oil. Woo! Don't baste yourself. Baste the fish. Baste the little pieces that are coming out and then leave them alone. Baste the fish, walk away. All right, let's check on these dudes. I mean, they're incredibly sexy already. I'm gonna wash my hands. Okay, so I'm gonna teach you a little secret here and not everybody's gonna share this secret with you, but I got you. I'm gonna teach you some secrets. So if you like for your fish fillet to look really smooth like this, you see how this is like kind of just a nice, it's very hot, nice smooth batter. Then you just do it how I just showed you. But if you like it to have like those rocky chunks on it, that's like kind of the crispy like bunches on top of it, I got you. I'm going to show you what you do. You're going to go ahead and fry it to that point. You see where it is? You're going to lift that out of there and then you're going to take your batter and you're going to take a spoon. Ooh, of the raw batter and put it just like this right there oh yeah right on it and you're gonna drop it back in and you're gonna see in just a second what's gonna happen is it's gonna give it like this rocky kind of crunchy textures on top it's gonna be gorgeous I'm gonna go ahead I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna baste those though I want to make sure that I'm getting that nice and wet right there with that hot oil get that all over it oh yeah baby get that on there that's the goods right there i like to have those little rocky bits on top of mine those like kind of crunchies that you bite into that like i don't necessarily want a perfectly smooth batter like some factory made it for me i wanted to feel like i have like some like this bite was kind of smooth and the next one's like when i bite into it so I'm gonna baste that. Baste it. You gotta baste it, baby. You gotta baste it. You gotta earn those crunchy bites. You gotta earn those crunchy bites. Do it. Get up in it. It's worth it, trust me. Let that fry for a second. We're gonna give that another second. We're gonna flip it and I'm gonna show you the difference. All right, I'm gonna gently grab a hold of that guy right there. You see where we just poured the batter on top, how it's puffing up, it's got that extra goodness to it. I'm going to give it a little flip right there and go ahead and do its friend. 
go ahead and get that guy flipped also. Let them cook. Gonna get those Rocky Mountains on top. Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> All right, so I am pulling these out. I kind of had rearranged them a little bit. I've been flipping them. I've been moving them around. You can see, let me show you. Look at that. You see where I poured the batter on top of it? That little mountain that gave it this beautiful kind of crispy layer on top of it. This is going over here onto this pan. You see that sexy right there? That's the sexy that I poured on top. That's a secret right there. So while I'm doing my fries, which is only gonna take about six minutes, I'm going to keep these at 200 degrees, which is warm in my oven. That low temperature is gonna get them nice and crispy. It's gonna almost be like toasting them up even more. We're gonna have these amazing, beautiful, kind of biting in crunchiness that's gonna be freaking awesome that I'm gonna show you when I get them all finished. So we have our fish in the oven. I have cranked up this oil to 375. It is nice and hot, and that is going to be perfect for the next French frying. As you can see, I was going to tell you how stiff that was, but it broke. <laughs> no, as you can see, though, seriously, these French fries firmed up quite a bit. What you want to do is kind of just drop them in there. You always want to lay them away from yourself. Like when you drop them in, go that way, right? So no oil is splashing towards you. And we're just going to drop in, not too many, don't overcrowd it because two things are going to happen if you overcrowd it. One, you are going to cool down your oil too much and you're not going to have that high temperature that's needed for the nice like frying to happen. And the other thing is you're going to get like some steam action happening within your french fries. And instead of getting crisp, you're going to get soggy. So we want to have that nice crispness on the outside. It's really important not to overcrowd as you're dropping them in. Put a few in at a time. Put them over here on your little situation. Did I even show this to y'all? What I have here, you should have like a grill rack or something like that, but I don't actually own one, but I have these cooling racks that I use when I bake and then I use them when I need them. I lined this with foil. I have a sheet pan. I have my little rack here. It should be a grilling rack, but it's not. I'll buy one one day, not today. And I'm just gonna kind of put these on top of it as they come out of there. If you put them onto a paper towel, that will also work, but the situation is basically this. If you put your hot fries onto a paper towel, you're gonna get the steam happening and the one back side is gonna get a little sogified while the other side is gonna stay crispy. So if you wanna keep the nice crispness around your entire fry, you're gonna want something that keeps it off the ground. And by that, I mean that you're gonna have this little lift. Here is oh, the absolute most freaking beautiful fries. Check those out. You see this beautiful golden color? Those are looking gorgeous. What do you think? Should we pull them? Give them a little shaky poo. Hear it? That's Christmas. That's what you hear. They're going over here. For the Christmas. You also want to hit them with some iodized salt as soon as they come out. Give them a little sprinkle. Okay, so I personally, when I make any kind of fries or fried food, I like to use an iodized salt. It doesn't have to be this brand, but like the small table salt, it doesn't even really have to be iodized, but iodine is good for your system. Just so you know, I'm just saying you should probably use iodized salt. But anyway, any table salt, which is like a really, really small grain salt, and the reason that I personally like to use that is because when you put it onto the really hot fries, it just melts right into it. When you use the larger grain salt, it doesn't really melt into it. It kind of sticks to it, which is also nice because you can see it. So if you want to be able to see the salt, you're going to use like a kosher or a sea salt or something like that or like the pink Himalayan salt. You can use any of those if you want to. They're all really nice finishing salts, so they are appropriate for this. But flavor-wise, I personally really like the iodized or like some sort of table salt, a really small grain salt. Totally up to you. What? I like kosher. Yeah, well, <laughs> So there is a really big difference between a French fry and a chip. So I feel like the biggest difference is a chip is boiled and then fried and a French fry is fried and then fried. So when you have a finished chip, you should have like this super, super crunchiness that you don't necessarily get with a French fry. Like with a French fry, you have a tiny bit of crispiness on the outside, definitely. You have like the fluffiness on the outside, but with a chip, you should have like a hard core, like, crunch when you bite into it. So this is a chip. 
this is what a authentic chip should look like, right? So when I bite into this, we should hear, and then when I break it for you, you should see the fluffiness. So are we gonna do this? Are we testing this out? I'm not scared at all, are you? I'm not scared. <laughs> You hear it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right? When we look inside. Oh, did you see that? It is soft goodness. Oh, yeah, dude. It is goodness on the inside, I'm telling you. Crispy outside, soft inside. Hair crunch. Hair <laughs> crunch. That's what you're looking for, you guys. That's the difference between a chip and a fry. They're both amazing, but they are both their own thing. Don't get it wrong. So the very last thing that we need to do if you are serving authentic fish and chips is you have to make the mushy peas. So there are a lot of different ways to do this, but we're gonna do it this way. The first thing that I have going here is some butter on my stove. I almost dropped my thing here. I have this on like a medium heat, nice and melted down. I'm going to add in a little bit of shallots. No particular measurement. Get them in there. I also have a little bit of garlic. Garlic going in. I'm gonna give this a nice stir just to kind of get it sauteing around. I'm gonna hit this up with a little bit of kosher salt. A little bit of freshly ground pepper. Here I have a couple of cups of frozen peas. It's cool, you know, unless you feel like shucking peas all day, which I know I daggone don't, I am going to go ahead and use the frozen peas. Bam! Peas are going in. Give them a nice little stir. Oh, right? A little bit of pepper. You're gonna stir these until they get like a really bright green color. When they start to get the nice bright green, they are good to go. Don't cook them past that. Once our peas are hitting this like nice kind of bright greenness, start kind of like doing this, right? Mush, 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 mushy, mush. That's how you answer the phone if you live in Japan. Mushy, mush, right? We're gonna mush these. You don't wanna mash them up too much because what you're gonna miss is like the pop in your mouth, right? Which is important. So you want like a little bit of mashiness, but not too much mashiness. I'm gonna turn my heat off at this point. I'm gonna add in, I have some mint. Ooh, that is like the super tradition inside of my mushy peas. Mushy peas and mint, that is it. That is the traditional side of fish and chips. All right, let's do this. And pour my beautiful IPA right down the edge. Get that freaking fat head on it. That is what I'm talking about. There are two ways to eat fish and chips. You can either give it a little squeeze of lemon right on top or some malt vinegar, whatever you prefer. Take a nice piece of fish. We're gonna take it. And let me tell you, this has been sitting here for a few minutes, so mind the crispness. I'm gonna get a nice little bite. Put that here for a second. Can you hear it? Ready? Mmm. Mmm, -hmm. God. It is so crispy. Not only is it crispy, but let me tell you what, the pieces that we fried 40 minutes ago are also still crispy. And then we have these fries, listen. Can you hear it? I know you can. Mmm. They're amazing. Crispy, outside, fluffy, inside, mushy peas, traditional side. Mmm. Oh my goodness. The freshness of the mint goes along with the peas, the like butteriness is so, so amazing together. You guys, if you've never had this, 
Mmm. Can you hear it? So good. If you can't hear it, this because my camera and microphone suck. Seriously, listen. You hear it now? Mmm. <laughs> It's amazing. Make this. You're going to love it. It's going to be the best fish and chips you've ever had in your life. And I will make that statement. Hey, let me tell you something real quick too. If you don't know how to eat fish and chips, the way you want to do it is get a little scoop of the tartar sauce. Put it on top. You don't go in for the dip. Mmm. Get a little forkful. That's what you do. Mm-hmm. Mmm. It's so good. I can't even tell you. Mmm. It's crazy crispy. It's good. The peas like settle it out. They have freshness. They're amazing. Best fish and chips ever. That's it. You guys, if you haven't subscribed, do it now. Can't take it. I'll see you in the next video. Happy cooking. Mm-mm-mm. Best bites forever.